I'm not going to mention all the kinds of security threats that we can think about because our experts here are going to do it for us. But we want to talk about what kinds of security issues are we facing, what do they potentially mean for Canada, and what should the next government do, what can they do about this type of security and defense issues, and what kind of role should Canada play in this new security policy. To consider these issues, we have assembled an eminently well-qualified panel. I am going to introduce them quite briefly, because all of them have such long, long CVs that if I were to read out all of it, we would not really never get started. My apologies for some of the disruptions at the back. I'll pause for a moment before I introduce them. Do we have enough chairs? There was a cocktail reception in the other big room. <laughs> we should have been there instead, right? Don't tell them that, though. No. <laughs> this is much more interesting. Okay, so uh, our panelists for tonight in alphabetical order. Alex Bouvier is a national politics reporter with the Toronto Star, Ottawa Bureau. He's covering, he has been covering Parliament Hill since 2013 and he is currently knee-deep in covering the current election. So for a while we were worried that he wouldn't make it and managed to tear himself away, but we're very grateful to you, Alex, for being here. We have next Richard Fadden, who is a senior fellow in the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs here at the University of Ottawa. From 2015 to 2016, he was the National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister, and before that, from 2013 to 2015, he was Deputy Minister of National Defence, and before that again, he served as Director of the Canadian Security and Intelligence Services. So, eminently well qualified to speak of one of the issues that I know is on people's minds today, which is the RCMP issue. Um, on the end, at the end of the table, Barbara Falk is a professor in the Department of Defence Studies at the Canadian Forces College, Royal Military College of Canada. She's an expert on national security law and policy and has written extensively on these issues in academic journals and in policy outlets. At the end of the table, Thomas Junot is a professor in the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, also here at the University of Ottawa. His research focuses on the Middle East and most particularly on Iran and on Yemen and also on Canadian foreign and defense policy. And Tama also worked for a long period from 2003 to 2014 with the Department of National Defense, mostly as a policy analyst covering the Middle East. So I think we could not have a much more well-qualified panel of experts to discuss security and defense issues in the forthcoming election. The way it's going to work is as follows. I've asked the panelists to prepare about five to eight minutes of some of the most pressing issues as they see it. And then we will have a little bit of a conversation and then we will open it up for questions and answers. We have agreed an order of proceedings and Bridget Fan is going to kick us off to start. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Thank you for being here. Um, let me start by just disagreeing a little bit with one thing that Rita said. I don't think it's possible today to talk about foreign policy or defense policy or security policy separately. So what I'm going to talk about, please keep in the back of your mind, I'm talking about national security, which in my mind encompasses all of this and some aspects of international trade and economic policy and development policy. And it seems to me that if we don't do that in this country, we're missing opportunities to manage our relationships with the rest of the planet. The days when you can sort of use security and isolation of foreign policy or defense and isolation of the other, I would argue, uh, are past. So let me start with a couple of basic assumptions. I think there are two ways for Canada to deal with national security challenges. One is to deal them event by event. Uh, you know, you'll all remember Harold Macmillan. What was the most thing that shocked you the most when you were prime minister? Events, dear boy, events. Uh, and I think that's one of the characteristics of Canadian national security policy. We tend to respond to events rather than develop a strategy, in part because there are no votes in national security. Ask any minister of public safety, and he will confirm that, jumping up and down with enthusiasm. 
The other alternative, I think, is to develop a view of our, of our environment, and that's what I'm going to talk about, and try and affect ways of dealing with that environment. So when I talk about environment, I think there are two components to it, our own environment and the world. So I'd like to start by saying a few words about our own environment, because I think to some degree our ability to deal with national security threats is a function of how we view ourselves, and to some degree our enemies are us. We shoot ourselves in the foot sometime when we try to deal with national security issues broadly, broadly defined. Um, I think one of the difficulties we have is we're not accepting that our status in the world is not the same as it was in the 60s and 70s. And in fact, it's even more significantly changed over the last few years because of the distinguished current inhabitant of the White House, south of us. But even if he were not to be re-elected, I would argue that the United States is never going to embrace us in the same way that it has in the past. And while we accept this intellectually, and I'm sure ministers and officials do this, I'm not sure that in their gut they've quite adjusted to all these facts. And in particular, it means, I think, that Canada has less influence than it had some time ago, whatever period you may, may choose. And the reason I'm emphasizing this, because I think our self-awareness on these issues is going to affect our capacity to deal with the various national security threats, challenges that my colleagues and I are going to talk about. Um, I, whatever I am, I'm not particularly partisan. I've had that beaten out of me after 40 years in the public service. So when I comment on what a government or other has done, I'm not being partisan. But I think, for example, the current government, the one that's now up for re-election, has been entirely too self-congratulatory about Canada's position in the world, and it's been noted. I mean, I've, I've, as is the case with many of you, I'm sure, I have friends around the world, and they sort of chuckle a little bit when we pat ourselves in the back quite as much as we have done over the course of the last little while. I don't think that's helpful. We need to be realistic. Uh, most of the problems that I'm going to talk about in a couple of minutes um, cannot be resolved by Canada alone. We are dreaming in technicolor if we think that we can, if that was ever the case. So our self-awareness will affect the extent to which we will attract allies, to the extent that we will be able to attract a coalition of the willing to deal with these various and sundry problems. I think this is particularly important because even if I look, narrow my considerations a little bit to security issues, National security, my one attempt at a soundbite is national security is not national. It truly is not anymore. It is international and it's also subnational. We ain't going to deal with these issues alone. So our self-awareness, where we fit in the world, what we can and can't contribute, I think is very, very, uh, very, very important. Um, one more comment or two small comments on our self-awareness. Uh, Whatever our status is in the world, we have to appreciate that words and values are not enough. We need money, money, resources, and persistence and commitment if we're going to move files around the planet. And we also are going to move them more quickly in some instances if we don't insist on having them on the front page with the story from Alex. But my point is, um, one of the flaws that I detected in my career in the federal government is we tend to ping around a little bit on foreign policy, except in, with respect of our principal allies. And then we're, when there's a problem, we tend to ask them for help. And that isn't the best way necessarily to, to get that kind of reaction. So we need to be strategic and we need to be persistent with other countries if we want their help. So let me turn a little bit to the international environment. I think there are four main issues that we need to worry about from a security perspective. One is the rise of revisionist states. The second is what I call the dysfunctional West. The third is what I would characterize as the growth of violent radicalism. And my fourth is sort of a general catch-all, uh, cyber issues, which is both a method and a substantive problem in and of itself. When I talk about revisionist states, I'm talking about Russia and China. Those are the two main ones. There are a number of other revisionist states. They're just smaller. Iran, Turkey, and a couple of others come to mind. We have to, I think, define carefully uh, what we what our relationship with these countries are going to be. To consider um, China, for example, to be a potential ally of Canada, I think is dreaming again in technicolor. I characterize them as a strategic adversary. They're more than a competitor, they're less than an enemy. And I think we need to work our way through relationships with them rather more than we have in the past. The dysfunctional West, 
I'm not going to go on too much about this, but our capacity to deal with security challenges and other challenges is a function of how the West is itself. What's the health of the West? Uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, Italy, some of the problems France and Germany is having, some of the very serious difficulties some other NATO members are having in terms of dealing with the, the Western approach to life involving democracy and whatnot. We are not in good shape. We're turning inwards, and we're not going to be able to deal, I would argue, with some of the problems that I and others are going to talk about. So dysfunctional West, I think, is a significant issue. And I want to stress that when I talk about a dysfunctional West, it doesn't mean that I put in that category countries that are simply more conservative than we are, which is something that we tend to do. Oh, if they're not, they don't share every single value we have, they're bad. Countries are entitled to be either more liberal or more conservative than we are up to a point, at which point I think we should start talking about it. The growth of, growth of violent radicalism. This is what people used to call terrorism. I don't refer to terrorism alone anymore because I think you can get uh, violence from the extreme right as well as from traditional terrorists like Al Qaeda and whatnot. I don't think they're going away. I think they're going to come back. And one of the reasons for this is that the West is dysfunctional and we can't get together to deal with them. But the other issue is we have not even begun to think about the underlying causes. The West has more than enough capacity, kinetic capacity, to thump any terrorist group on the planet. If we really set up our minds, the West could destroy Al-Qaeda or ISIS. It would be a cost, it would be unpleasant, but we could stop them. My problem with this is, it's like playing whack-a-mole. Remember the old game when the little thing comes up? That's exactly what the West did by and large in Syria. ISIS has been removed from Syria with some significant exceptions. And we could do the same in a variety of other parts of the planet. So I think we need to find some way, we Canada and the West generally, to deal with some of the underlying causes. Not easy, but up until recently, at least the United States was trying to have a discussion with the Taliban. Not an easy thing to do when people are extremists well beyond the comprehension of most people in the West. My last broad area is cyber issues. <coughs> and again, I think I'm running out of time. Rita's going to kick me soon. Um, so I'm just going to list four categories that I think we have to deal with. One is cyber espionage. The theft of intellectual property, the UN estimates, is over a trillion dollars a year. A lot of it from the revisionist states that I talked about. This, this is costing our economies uh, and our private sector a fortune. Cyber crime. If Rita had a member of the RCMP on this panel, they could go on for hours on end. We are significantly underestimating the capacity of the, of the worldwide web to promote criminal activity, ranging from the exchange of pornography to extracting money from your bank accounts, denying you access to your whatever. I mean, you can go on and on and on. Cyber war. The, war, the, the law of armed conflict has not yet come to grips with cyber, cyber, the cyber capacity to basically shut down um, societies. If what the Russians did in Crimea had been done kinetically, we probably would have had a significant Russian war. But they did it all in a cyber sense, and they closed down their electrical system and their communication system, and it facilitated their kinetic invasion. We need to work through when a cyber attack is the equivalent of an old-fashioned uh, kinetic attack, and I don't think we're anywhere near that yet. And another, and I'm almost finished, the most important component of this is cyber propaganda, cyber prop. It is significantly, it, it has a significant capacity to change the way that we think, generally. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But when the propaganda is entirely negative, as much of it is, it has an impact on our capacity to do a whole variety of things. So, in closing, what do we do about this? We have to be more self-aware than we have been. We need to understand we can accomplish virtually nothing alone. We can only act with other countries in concert. And we need to appreciate that talking and being good is not enough. We have to put resources of various sorts where our mouths are if we're going to accomplish anything globally. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Stop, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I feel like you set me up so nicely. Um, the check is in the yeah, exactly. Um, I'm going to not focus on what I'm going to put on the table right now. I'm going to push them off the table, but I just feel like they need to be said, so I'm going to say them. And that is, I think there are two global ontological security challenges that have the possibility of being major game changers, which are climate change 
and the massive increase in uh, global economic inequality. But they are so global and such a large scale, and to some degree we're dealing a little bit more on the Canadian perspective. I'm going to table them, put them aside, and then talk more about um, challenges that are more a feature of the right here and right now in terms of this uh, election campaign. And I want to uh, agree with what Dick said about national security encompassing everything for security policy, defense policy, and so on. But I also wanted to reinforce what you said, uh, which I'm going to say something differently, about the inside-outside nature of uh, international relations right now, which is the really, truly local threats are global, and global threats are localized in all kinds of interesting ways. And I'm going to focus my con con comments on one area in which I'm drilling down, so this is going to be more of a drilling down discussion, and that is on what is increasingly called hybrid warfare, hybrid strategy, strategies, uh, gray zone influence strategies, which picks up on what you said because it comes out of the revision of states. A lot of it happens through cyber prop in the cyber zone, and a lot of it promotes internal illiberalisms. So I think I'm cutting at it in a way that's consistent with what you're talking about, but I'm going to drill down a little bit more. The reason I'm focusing on that is that I've been recently affiliated with the Hybrid Warfare Center in Finland, and uh, so I'm focusing just more on this in terms of my research. And so what I'm talking about is um, the actions of the revisionist, to use your language, the revisionist states, or the, the global great power uh, powers that have the ability to function as spoilers, for for whom democratic checks, checks and balances are not an issue, who have no problem working in uh, illegal slash gray zones, or dealing in areas in which they can, at least for a time, allege uh, some kind of plausible deniability, remember the little green man, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Crimea, and of course later the alleged non-assistance of Russians in the Donbass and Eastern Ukraine. Um, and I'm talking about also efforts that um, invade our national spaces, and to a large degree invade our national spaces through um, social media, through electoral interference, <coughs> Uh, through misinformation and disinformation strategies. Sometimes it's aimed at us, sometimes it's about us somewhere else. Um, some of you may know we have a, we've had a brigade group in, Lat in Latvia, um, uh, of Reassurance, which is part of Canada's response to what happened in Crimea and Ukraine. And there's a really interesting narrative. You hear all about it in Eastern Europe, where I spend quite a lot of time. Uh, well, I've talked to a lot of Canadians, they don't, they don't hear about it, and it's a, it's a misinformation narrative about Russian tr about Canadian troops, and it's filtered through Russian-speaking minorities in in now NATO spaces, particularly in the Baltic states. And it goes something like this: Canada has a gay brigade led by pedophile Russell Williams. That's the story. It's infused with this kind of interesting, toxic, militarized masculinity, which fits in with particular you know, Russian ideological narratives right now, and it's designed, obviously, to, to belittle and to, um, you know, make fun of uh, Canadian forces, uh, forces abroad. Um, and it's one in which, you know, we kind of can laugh at, except, and a lot of these things we can laugh at because they seem like they're so in the realm of the crazy, except that there's a certain amount of, certain amount of take up. Now, I have a kind of a, a generalized view of how hybrid strategies work, and I call it my Battle of Winterfell metaphor. How many of you guys watch Game of Thrones season eight? Okay, enough of you, this is gonna make sense. So you know, or some of you just, you know, spoilers all around, okay? Uh, and that is, in the Battle of Winterfell, you have an adversary, they're the White Walkers. The White Walkers have this interesting ability to turn your dead soldiers into their soldiers. It's a cool little magic trick. And that's kind of how hybrid warfare works, it, particularly in a cyberspace, particularly in a social media space, where you have disinformation and misinformation, um, which amplifies um, you know, illiberal um, and polarizing effects um, that further promote echo chambers and bubbles of you know, you know, polarizing insecurity and so on. So in a sense, what happens through this process, and it's like multiple processes, some of it's state-directed, some of it's decentralized, again, allowing for plausible deniability, and effectively, we become 
our own adversary. Maybe in a slightly different way that, that, that you uh, mentioned, but nonetheless, we do become, our own populations become gullible and unknowing foot soldiers, or kind of agent provocateur in somebody else's uh, security and defense strategy, right? You can't, it's really hard to win, because we don't have the magic trick that we had in Game of Thrones, which is you just knock off the King White Walker and everybody else crumbles and, you know, Bob's your uncle. That's the spoiler. <laughs> Sorry, we're, yeah. we're saving it. <laughs> it's, it's not how the season ends. So that, that's the major thing. Um, uh, in any event, uh, we don't have that, uh, we don't have that advantage. So what, what do we have in our sort of arsenal of preparatory or defensive strategies and tactics that we can deal with this? Well, and some of this, by the way, I think we really need to pay attention to right now because we're in the middle of an election campaign. And also, I think there's a way in which Canada can look to two other countries, which I'm going to name in a moment, to talk about how we do this well. Uh, number one, uh, looking, looking at the electoral controls and experiences of other states. You know. Um, you know, the U.S. hasn't done this well, Sweden has done this well, you know, there are examples we can look to. Public education and media liter literacy, we have to learn to play the long game. And it's quite funny, like quite often I hear people say, you know, we should be teaching media literacy in school. That's true, but last time I checked, it's not the average 14-year-old that can't figure out what truth is. It's the average 57-year-old that can't figure out what truth is. It's my mother in her late 70s who thinks that she still owes the CRA money because, you know, you guys all know about the scams, right? So um, those kinds of things, um, we need to focus on not just new voters, but aging voters. We need to focus on getting more voter turnout. Voter turnout helps in a number of ways. A, obviously, it, it, uh, it helps address a democratic deficit, obviously. But usually when we get more voter turnout, we're getting people in the 18 to 30 age group. By getting people in the 18 to 30 age group, you're actually getting um, arguably a more sophisticated group of voters when it comes to uh, cyber literacy and so on. Um, the other challenge is a challenge we have in every um, security and defense expenditure envelope, and that is when we invest money in prevention, there are no obvious measurable payoffs or metrics. Um, so you can't, it's really hard to measure what doesn't happen, and this is always a challenge in obtaining and sustaining adequate resources year over year, especially in this country where we have an unfortunate tendency to make partisan issues out of even basic replacement procurement decisions, and I think that's a, that's a, that's a challenge. Um, I think I'll probably end it there, because um, I see the red line, uh, the, red, the red box, and I'll leave, save the rest for discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So my presentation will differ from the first two ones in two main ways. Uh, first of all, I will focus very much on machinery issues, on government machinery. And second, I will actually talk about good news, about positive uh, trends, uh, as opposed to the doom and gloom of my two colleagues. That was supposed to be my beat, as a journalist. That was supposed to be my beat. Sorry. Uh, I will specifically talk about three trends of change in the Canadian intelligence community uh, in recent years that I think are positive trends. My main point will be that a lot of progress still has to be done, and that hopefully will continue, but these are three positive trends that I will uh, talk about. And I do also want to add that uh, these three trends are a bit of a hodgepodge of different research projects that I have right now on the intelligence community. Some of them are uh, my own, some of them are, jo are joint projects with Stephanie Carvin from Nipsey at Carleton. So uh, uh, some of the, the credit for all the good stuff goes to her for, for some of these points. Um, point number one is transparency, or the issue of trust of relationships between CSIS and others in the intelligence community and Canadians in general and some specific communities. There has been a lot of criticism recently, there has always been criticism of that. Uh, last week, an op-ed in the Toronto Star that CSIS systematically targets Muslim communities. Earlier this summer, in the Toronto Star, sorry. Uh, <laughs> another op-ed uh, basically literally saying that CSIS is a political police that targets opponents of the government, uh, whether liberal or conservative. Um, now, I think both of these op-eds, I really apologize, are completely wrong. Um, I know why you invited me now. <laughs> um, yes, mistakes have been made in the past, and it's not to deny these mistakes, uh, but I, I thought that they were fundamentally 
inaccurate and full of either factual mistakes or highly uh, debatable uh, interpretations. That being said, um, as much as I think these are misperceptions, perceptions matter in politics. And when misperceptions are so frequent, they have very material consequences, um, especially when they're prevalent like that, uh, for many reasons. But one of them is that CSIS, uh, its currency is information, one of its currencies. And when there is so much mistrust with specific communities, it hampers CSIS's ability to gather the best information at the right time in the right format. Uh, and that not only hurts CSIS's ability to do its job, but it hurts all of us uh, in one way or another. Because these misperceptions are so prevalent, one of the, the point I want to make here is that the onus largely falls on CSIS, on the government, on the international security community to make a better, to, uh, do a better job of correcting these misperceptions. Because I do think that a lot of the blame does go to CSIS because uh, they have not done a, a good enough job over the years. And by CSIS, that was the, the, the main topic of that, that op-ed, but I think it goes to the intelligence community in general, of, of being transparent enough, of being forthcoming enough on its activities to correct these misperceptions. Uh, so what can be done? Well, at some point, if people, for ideological reasons, really hate you and think you're a political police, there may be little you can do. But overall, with Canadians, with Muslim communities, with other communities, uh, I think the onus is on the intelligence community to be more transparent, uh, to do a better job of explaining what it does, of having a stronger public profile, uh, to, um, to explain that and to, to play its role in correcting these misperceptions. I think that's the right thing to do on a moral level. In a democracy, uh, government in general should be more transparent. We're okay at that in Canada, but we could do far better. But there are also pragmatic or strategic reasons to do that, because by being more transparent, CSIS can better develop trust with specific communities, but also by being more open to scrutiny, it pushes it to be more, uh, more, uh, more competitive, more effective, which in the end is also uh, positive. Why I am putting this, uh, despite these, these, this criticism, under the uh, positive trend or good news story, I think in the last two or three years, one of the under-recognized stories in this country is that our intelligence community has undergone a quiet revolution, and I don't think that is too strong a word, on the transparency front. Uh, there are miles and miles and miles of progress still to do, uh, but we are at a point today that was inconceivable five years ago in terms of the transparency of CSIS, the RCMP, CSC, the Signals Intelligence Agency has a public profile in a way that it was inconceivable only a few years ago. All of that is extremely positive, uh, but it is only first steps. Point number two, or trend number two I want to talk about is the intelligence community's relations with uh, non-traditional partners. If you look at the main emerging threats to Canada that were discussed in the two uh, opening presentations, you think about elections meddling by Russia and, according to CBC Today, six other countries. You think about foreign investment, especially by Chinese SOEs and others, returning foreign fighters, right-wing extremism. Obviously, to counter these new threats, uh, you, there's a big role for traditional actors, CSIS, RCMP, CSC, and, and a few others. That being said, much more than previous threats, going back to the Cold War, but even you know, conventional AQ-style terrorism, there is a far bigger role for non-traditional actors in the Canadian government who are not members of the security and intelligence community. Um, think about elections meddling. Uh, CSC in the last few years has developed a very close partnership with Elections Canada. I would have loved to be in the room for the first meeting between these two organizations uh, when there was the first conversation. Um, these are people who lived until recently on two different planets. Um, elections Canada had no security culture, very few people with security clearances, no skiffs, a secure zone to, to store and um, uh, classified stuff. Uh, no tradition of using uh, intelligence and vice versa CSC had virtually no or very little tradition of talking to somebody like that in an unclassified setting with folks who did not belong to that security culture we could give a lot of other examples think about investment um, the organization formerly known as Industry Canada I said now uh, manages the Investment Canada Act a very difficult and complex process to make review decisions on foreign investment especially by Chinese SOEs state-owned enterprises um, as part of my project with Stephanie, we've interviewed a lot of people involved in those, uh, in those processes. In my career in the government or in those interviews, rarely have I heard such bitterness, uh, such hostility, such negative experiences as those people involved in the ICA, the Investment Canada Act process. Uh, but it's, it's improving. It has improved a lot, and that is very positive. So taking a step back, there is a very clear positive trend of the Canadian intelligence community learning to work with non-traditional partners. 
a lot of progress still to do, but a lot of progress done, and I think that's a good news story that has to be told. Point number three, and that's my last point, um, how the intelligence community understands its clients, the policy world, and vice versa. One of the main findings in our project is that the level of literacy in the intelligence community on policy issues is very low. Understanding of the policy process, policy priorities, and so on. And vice versa, in the policy world, at Global Affairs, at PCO, at, among political staff, understanding of the world of intelligence is very low. That's problematic, because intelligence is gathered and analyzed for the purpose of impacting positively policy. But if there's limited understanding, it's difficult for that connection to be made. 15 years ago, and, and we're trying to track that evolution of policy literacy and intelligence, intelligence literacy and policy, 15 years ago it was abysmal. Uh, but a series of shocks to the system, the war in Afghanistan obviously being a big one where suddenly Canadians were dying in, in Kandahar, uh, but then all the other threats that were talked about that, that I briefly mentioned, that has led to significant improvements in recent years in mutual understanding of each other. Um, again, miles to go in terms of progress, but again, the, the literacy, the level of understanding of the other has uh, significantly improved. And I think, again, that is a, a positive trend that needs to be uh, explained, that needs to be understood and recognized. And I am Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you brought in a ringer for the uh, <laughs> final. Uh, uh, look, it's a, it's a real honor to be here and to be invited. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Tomah, for that. Um, I'm happy to be here to share the perspective from the cheap seats, um, where we don't have any access to inside information or necessarily a culture of understanding uh, intelligence uh, or policy. Um, and it's been my experience that um, the work that journalists do not only in the national security or foreign policy space, uh, but just generally is not very well understood on the other side, uh, on the intelligence community side or on the policy side. So I'm happy to take any sort of general questions you may have about what, uh, you know, the glamorous day-to-day -day life journalist. Um, I'm going to start with uh, kind of just a brief overview in the context of the election of the politics of national security with regard to the individual parties. Um, apologies if this is um, half thought out, but I've been up since 6 a.m. doing radio because there's an election on, so I'm very tired. <laughs> um, so we'll start with the, the, the Liberals, obviously. Um, by now, I don't need to explain uh, the Liberals' approach to foreign policy to, to anybody in this room, certainly. Um, it's been fairly well articulated by both uh, Minister Christine Freeland uh, and also Ralph Goodale on the national security front. Um, you know, Christy Freeland has set us up as the sort of traditional middle power, um, trying to you know, convey those values-based uh, sort of priorities that Canada has while recognizing our you know, limited ability to um, push those on our own. Um, and of course, we're also managing reality, uh, managing relations with much bigger fish, namely the US and China. Um, that's been sort of put an exclamation point on that this year. Um, on the national security front, obviously, we have Bill C-59. Um, uh, Mr. Fadden uh, lived through C-51 in that debate and C-59, so he'd be better uh, qualified to speak on it than, than me. But obviously, we now have a, a signals intelligence agency with an offensive, man, uh, offensive mandate um, and uh, some uh, capacity for CSIS to disrupt threats. So that's kind of, I don't have to explain to anybody in this room where the liberals are at. Um, I think less well articulated is the conservative vision for foreign policy and national security. Um, they haven't really been pushed very strongly, mostly because journalists in this country don't typically focus on foreign policy very strongly or in a sustained way, uh, except you know outside of events. Um, you know, they, Mr. Shear has uh, promised a reset uh, in relations with China. I don't know what that looks like. Um, that has not been articulated and I'm not sure that there's any appetite on the part of the Chinese to actually reset. I think they're, they're probably happy with where things stand right now. Um, and U.S. missile defense, that old chestnut. So that's kind of basically what we know about the party who could be government after October 21st and their priorities for uh, foreign uh, affairs. The NDP, Greens, and the Bloc Québécois uh, are almost completely domestic facing in their policy proposals. Uh, this election, at least so far, we're only seven days in, although it feels like a lot longer. <laughs> um, uh, I think the, the, the most foreign-facing 
policy area for them, uh, for all three of those parties, is the issue of climate change, as Barbara mentioned. Um, that's that has national security implications, huge national security implications. Um, so the most generous uh, assessment of their foreign policy we can make is that they really care about climate change, uh, which may be enough. Um, and then we have the People's Party of Canada, um, very intentionally moder modeled after the populist movements in the United States, but also in, in uh, Europe, um, very sharply anti-immigration, very insular, um, but uh, Max Bernier, our, foreign, our former foreign minister, is unlikely to decide, be deciding our foreign policy or national security policy anytime soon. Uh, so maybe we can just bracket them off to the side as uh, an interesting cultural phenomenon. Um, <laughs> this isn't being broadcast, right? <laughs> um, in terms of foreign policy and national security as an election issue, I think the common understanding is that Canadians do not vote based on parties foreign policy or national security policy especially. Um, you know, Public Policy Forum has recently done some very in-depth polling on what journalists and candidates talk about and what people actually give a damn about, um, and <laughs> they're not the same. Um, journalists, you'll be surprised to know perhaps, uh, actually talk about foreign policy a lot more um, than maybe you would think, um, just reading the newspaper, versus uh, how much Canadians actually care about it. Um, but as Barbara mentioned, you know, even if we don't think of these issues in terms of foreign policy, they do have a very direct and immediate impact on our domestic policy. So maybe that distinction is perhaps unhelpful um, in thinking about what actually matters to the country. Um, but you know, I, I would say that national security policy is in increasingly creeping into non-traditional uh, areas, as uh, as you pointed out. Um, in terms of CSE's relationship with Elections Canada. Um, you know, we're increasingly asking our intelligence communities to do things that they have not done in the past um, and perhaps are not terribly comfortable with in all, in all circumstances. Um, intelligence is increasingly becoming or perhaps being revealed again as more central. Um, Dick, you mentioned um, you know, the centrality of it to not only foreign policy, defense policy, but I would also say economic policy, um, certainly in the case of China. Um, and I don't think we've had a very developed conversation about that in Canada. It probably is overdue. Um, if all of this is true, I think I would argue that if these questions seem to be more central in our conversation around elections and around policy and around the choice that Canadians have on October 21st. Um, will it be? No. <laughs> it will not. Um, but, but I think that how the Canadian government manages this file will be under more scrutiny in a time where we cannot automatically depend on the United States or Western Europe to uh, promote our interests or be on side with our interests. Um, you know, given NAFTA, given China, um, you know, the, the UK post-Brexit, um, you know, even think of all the criticism that the Prime Minister received over his foreign travel over the last number of years. Um, you know, it may not ever be a ballot box question, but these things do matter as a fundamentally political issue, fundamentally domestic political issue. Um, now, let me talk a little bit about trying to do journalism in this context. We necessarily have an incomplete picture. We'll never have the full picture of what actually goes on. Um, my uh, experience of trying to figure out what the hell is going on in the RCMP this week would lead me to believe that, that that's the case. Um, but as you mentioned, it's better than it was in 2015. And I want to uh, um, especially single out CSE as having made incredible strides, not only because there's a communications officer from CSE in the audience tonight. Um, <laughs> Hi, Laura. Um, uh, but because um, they, I started covering national security issues um, in 2013 with the Snowden disclosures. And the evolution of CSE in that time has been astonishing when it comes to how willing they are to explain what they're doing. Um, the other agencies still need a bit of work, the RCMP specifically. But you know, I'll note that Commissioner Lucky had a, a press conference today to explain what little she could about the situation that force is, is facing, so that's positive, um, uh, a positive development. Uh, 
red line. I would just say the other challenge the journalists face covering this space is that we no longer have a system of specialized reporters with deep institutional knowledge of uh, any issue, frankly. Um, no longer can we devote weeks to specific issues. Um, the beast has to be fed daily. Um, and so the lack of an emphasis on from news organizations, not mine, which is fantastic, and you should all subscribe, um, <laughs> but news organizations generally about um, you know valuing specialized reporting and institutional knowledge and developing sources and understanding things, so crucial in a national security space, but crucial in any space um, that reporters work in. Um, it's troubling, and it's only going to get worse. So uh, since you did the optimistic bit, I'll end on the pessimistic note. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Before we open it up for questions, I, I would like to just take uh, Alexander on the, the sort of slightly more downbeat, but you also did recognize that in some ways what uh, Tamar called the quiet revolution mm -hmm. uh, had made it somewhat easier to be a journalist working on national security issues. I wonder if I could just take that quiet revolution and the optimism of Tamar and put it back to, to Dick and Barbara and some of the challenges that you pointed to about hybrid warfare, about provisional states. Do you see, do you share some of that optimism that somehow this, this re quiet revolution can also make it easier to tackle some of the challenges you put on the agenda? Uh, I'd like to go first, and it's a bit of a plug uh, in terms of where I work. One source of optimism I have is the last, I guess it is, 11-year educational experiment, of which I think is very important, at the Canadian Courses College. We have a thing every year called the National Security Program. It brings together uh, senior Canadian and international officers, as well as executives from all government departments that touch on security which means that over the last decade in Canada, we've been A, building a security culture, but B, building um, networks and, you know, um, and connections and a sense of whole of government responses. And I like to think that some of those networks in some small way, perhaps are impacting on what you perceive to be as increasing cultures of openness and transparency, and even having the ability to talk to each other. I mean, you mentioned you would have liked to have sat at the table when Elections Canada sat down at CSE. The wonderful thing about my teaching is I get to sit down and view those kinds of conversations every day. And it's wonderful to note that the government of Canada is investing in that. Okay, I think that's that's a really uh, that's a really positive development. Sure. Well, I, I certainly agree that things are better from the intelligence community, uh, but uh, even if they're better in terms of transparency, and even if Alex and his colleagues continue to report and even report more, I'm afraid I'm going to be the Darth Vader of this discussion, <laughs> because um, I think the real issue, you know, the more serious issue, because the issue that we're talking about now is true, I think fundamentally Canadians do not feel threatened. I mean, for those of you who come from outside of Canada, you, you, it's almost palpable when you go to some parts of the world and you compare with Canada. I mean, we have three oceans, we have the United States. Most Canadians simply don't feel threatened. So no matter the development of the kind of culture that Barbara was talking about, the openness that Tama was talking about, and the kind of reporting that Alex is reporting about, I don't think it's going to resonate with Canadians. I mean, the only time we think about at any depth at all about these sorts of issues is when we're in the middle of a crisis. And that's the worst time to do it. You know, it's like the, you know, the, uh, the incident we had on Parliament Hill when you know, the, uh, the soldier was killed. We, you know, we all jumped around like chickens without egg heads for six months, and then it was gone. We don't have a culture in Canada that causes us to worry about these things like they do, not just in the United States, who remains, you know, the, uh, the main target. But in the United Kingdom, or France, or Germany, or large other parts, many, many other parts of the world. So given all of the positive things that people are saying, I still don't think it's going to resonate in the vast part of the Canadian public, because we don't feel threatened. So we chug along, and I think more than anything else, politicians know this. As I was mentioning when I was rambling on initially, there are no votes in national security. You know, unless there's a crisis, and then the votes are in dealing with the crisis effectively, not in having prevented it. So, um, I, I want to emphasize that my, my positive trends 
were on the machinery level, right? Not on, <laughs> on the environment itself. I, I should have avoided the word optimistic. I, I usually work on the Middle East, so I'm usually... <laughs> so I guess focusing my attention to the Canadian context maybe brought me the rays of sunlight. Um, on on uh, your last point, Canadians don't feel threatened. Canadians don't feel threatened because they're not threatened. Uh, our, you know, I was having, and I see some of my former students here, that I forget which classes you were in, if it was that class, but one question I asked the Middle East class, were you in the Middle East one or the Canadian foreign policy one? Middle East one. So in one of the first classes I asked you guys, how safe are we in Canada? Are we the safest country in the world? And if not, well, somebody at some point said Iceland. Okay. Um, um, so, because of that, I find that you know that the, the pressure that pushes governments to uh, act is extremely low. So, as much as I did depict positive trends, which I think are real and they matter, um, the ceiling for success is relatively low. In the sense that, as long as we are not significantly threatened, which I hope we're not, uh, you know, the, 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 the scope for further improvement uh, is not very high. And, and you know, we we hit diminishing returns pretty quickly. Um, you know, we have a limited culture of national security and intelligence at the highest levels of government. Uh, we interviewed uh, you know, about 70 people for our book, um, and uh, uh, it was stunning how, how that came out at a, at a very, very clear level. So as much as there are improvements, right, there's only so much we can do since, again, we are fundamentally safe. So, can I say something just on yeah, that, if yeah. you don't mind? I, I'm sorry. But I actually think, in particular, in respect of the cyber files, we are threatened. Yes, uh, that was one exception. And that's a biggie. It yeah. really is a biggie. Uh, you know, uh, our friend from CSE here can tell us how many times the government of Canada systems are pinged daily. And yeah, two billion. More than billion. You know, this is a lot. You know, I mean, IP theft out of Canada from China and Russia, very significant. I still think we are threatened a little bit more. I mean, domestic terrorism over the course of the last three or four years has resulted in some people being killed. A lot of, there, are, there are over 30 people in federal penitentiaries from having done things like that. I take Tomas' point that compared to other countries, we're pretty safe. My problem is if we don't feel threatened at all, it's very hard to have this kind of dialogue. That's all I was saying. Sorry, Alex. No, 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 not at all. I, I, that's exactly what I wanted to say. Um, and maybe I'll expand it a little bit. Um, you mentioned that when we're talking about national security, we're increasingly talking about everything. And so from a, from a kinetic sense, yeah, Canada is protected uh, by three oceans in the United States. But from an economic espionage sense, we are not. From a cyber sense, we are not. And where is the security framework moving towards? Mm -hmm. It's moving towards those areas. Um, on the domestic terrorism front, um, I think we had, and, and we did a series on right-wing extremism in Canada last year, and you know, Canadians might be surprised to think of some of the incidents that we've had as terrorism, because the news media does not call them terrorism. Um, but with the shooting in, in the, the mosque in Quebec City in, in 2017, I think that, that conversation has shifted a little bit. Um, but, but certainly I think that, that, that Dick is right, that we don't feel threatened. Um, and we may not feel threatened in that massive attack sort of sense. Um, but, but I think it would be a mistake for Canadians to think that they're immune from the same kind of trends that we see across allied nations and, and the democratic world.